we're going to finish up uh, my three-part series on healing and restoration. We're going to continue this series a little bit more, uh, but I'm, I'm going to wrap this particular uh, uh, teaching up around healing. We're going to go to Acts chapter number hmm, 20. Acts chapter number 20 is where we're going to spend our time on this morning talking about healing. And I'm going to invite uh, you to, to help us to preach this message this morning uh, through uh, your uh, engagement and your participation in the name of the Lord. How many of you know that uh, at every moment in time in our life, we are either in the state of being healed or we are in the state of uh, needing healing? Somebody say amen. Amen. But there is never a moment or time where we ought to uh, allow the opportunity for healing to pass us by. And so uh, I am excited about this passage. It's uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, it is uh, a passage of Scripture that really speaks in, in, in many respects to uh, the generational time in which we're living. Uh, some of us may or may not be aware uh, that there is a very important and powerful moment where God is always attempting to give us healing and give us strength and give us anointing for the day and the journey ahead. And if you're like me, I, I can always uh, find moments in my life where if I am not careful, healing will be so near to me, I will miss it. And I will find myself uh, not only in the need of healing, but running in the opposite direction of where healing is trying to manifest. And so I'm going to uh, help us this morning, hopefully to, to talk a little bit about the ways in which we can facilitate healing in our lives. And we're going to start in the biblical text, starting in Acts chapter 20, verse 7 uh, through 12. Amen. And that looks a little hard to read. Amen. And so uh, we're going to invite you, hopefully online, that feels or, or looks a little bit better. In the name of the Lord, let me just pull up my... My, my my sermon here, amen, my internet is uh, about as full of the devil some of these politicians this morning, amen. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter number 20, verse 7 through 12. And uh, this is the Apostle Paul, obviously, in the book of Acts. It is uh, the record of uh, the early church attempting to live into the unique call of God given to them after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, we find uh, that the early church literally had to contend with a culture and a society that was averse to the unique claims and teachings of Jesus. They were not uh, always welcomed with open arms. As a matter of fact, it is thought that many of the earliest followers of the way uh, were individuals who had to have worship in uh, places that other folks were afraid to go. Uh, they were known to worship in cemeteries because they knew the Roman soldiers would not follow them. And as they worshiped in the cemeteries, people who did not understand why they were worshiping there misunderstood them and mischaracterized them because they did not understand the depth of their commitment to meeting and gathering to worship Jesus. Many of them worshiped in places and were accused of worshiping in the dark because they did not want people to know that they were gathering. And so the, the extent to which the early church went in order to continue to have fellowship with one another and engage with uh, the, the teachings and the, the ministry of Jesus. Uh, it mirrors, I believe, the similar kinds of, of extents we are being asked to go to today. I mean, isn't it something that uh, while in the United States of America, uh, not all of us have had to... Um, uh, struggle to have church publicly like some countries uh, who outlaw the preaching of Christian faith. Uh, but how many know even in our history as, as, as African people here 
in these lands. Some, some of our own folk had to uh, steal away. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody. They, 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 they had to steal away to go hear the teachings of Jesus taught from a different perspective than their slave master. That whenever we are trying to facilitate liberation and freedom and healing and restoration, we ought not take it for granted that there will likely be obstacles in our way that we will have to overcome. And those obstacles may not all look the same. We don't have to worship in a cemetery, but now we have to worship with masks on. We may not have to worship in the dark, but now we have to worship through a virtual screen. And so we now, as a church, are joining the global, timeless, historical community of followers of Jesus having to press through struggle and trial just to get to Jesus. I want you to know, child of God, that while all this has been hard for us to navigate, uh, it does remind me of the scripture where it says, count it all joy. Why? Because the trying of our faith, it works patience. It joins us into that great cloud of witnesses. And that is what the book of Acts is attempting to do. It's attempting to talk a little bit about the early church's struggles of making uh, uh, known and widespread this gospel of Jesus Christ. So Acts chapter 20, verse number seven. Uh, Paul is in uh, a Greek part of the country. Uh, I think the town is called Troas, T-R-O-A-S. And so we're going to pick up at verse number seven. On the first day of the week when we met to meet bread, uh, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, Paul continued speaking until midnight. Amen. Paul was a little long-winded that day. Praise God. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. And a young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. And overcome by sleep, Eutychus fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over Eutychus, took Eutychus in his arms and said, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then Paul left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic today. Don't count them out. Amen. A third part of our uh, series on restore and healing. Don't count them out. God bless the word that has been read for your people. I pray God that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord because you don't count us out and we can get back up again in Jesus name we pray let the people of God say amen and amen there's a video I, I want you to play uh you know it it's a throwback video that uh I, I, I was chuckling with uh, my daughter uh, Nyla about and I said I'm gonna play this video to help contextualize the message for today uh, because sometimes we can fall down and think we can't get back up again. Uh, but I want to declare uh, that we ought not count ourselves or anyone else out. Uh, but let's see what this video says. Back in the day, commercials were simple and to the point, especially this classic. I've fallen, and I can't get up. Just Why is no one helping her? Help her! We're sending help immediately, Mrs. Fletcher. Oh, good, they're coming. The only help I had was this life call pendant I wear around my neck. I pressed the button. I've fallen and I can't get up! I've fallen and I can't get up! <laughs> 
is life alert. Are you okay? I've fallen off the ladder and I can't get up. I have fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> this is life alert. Are you okay? I've fallen and I can't get up. Life alert, as seen on TV. How many of you? Back in the day, commercials. Remember these simple. commercials. I've fallen and I can't get up. Uh huh. I've fallen and I can't get up. But uh, I want you to tell your neighbor real quick you can't get up, though. Amen. You can't get up. Uh, you ought to put in the chat, we can get up. Uh, because even though we may have fallen, we are not a people who must have our times of falling over determine the end. You know, it's a, a, a fascinating uh, a thing, you know, all these nursery rhymes. Uh, I was remembering uh, the Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Humpty Dumpty, no, Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. That sometimes we have been trained to think that falling is a permanent consequence when in reality we are a people who should know and be aware that God is always in the restoration business. God is a restorer and we have been talking about uh, the whole notion of reclaiming our faith and reimagining our faith, and dare I say, restoring our faith. And in a time when our faith has certainly gone through great challenges because of all of the tumult that is in the land, because our faith has had to endure the onslaughts of the enemy, because our faith has continuously had to uh, stand up against the kind of contradictions that we often are never fully aware of or have to grapple with until they come knocking on your door. We are a people then who must always, as we find ourselves in these uh, commercial moments, uh, falling down and thinking you can't get up, we must always be people who understand that we can get up again. But not through the power of our own strength, but that there is help. Somebody say there is help. There is a helper. There is a mechanism for us to be restored. Now, it's worth saying that not all restoration projects are meant for our good. Uh, there are people who are, in go on, are, are endeavoring to create a restoration project around uh, the way they view life decades ago. There are people, we have already talked about the elections, right? And that in this moment in time, there are folks who are trying to restore an archaic framework of participation in democracy in this country. And they are investing millions of dollars in advertisement and in commercials and in propaganda to restore a time where you and I did not have access or as much access to the ballot as we have today. There are individuals who are even right now attempting to restore a certain kind of hierarchy in the world where they maintain the power and the wealth while the demographics are changing, they want to restore a time. It's kind of tantamount to uh, the biblical text in, in, in the book of Exodus when Pharaoh saw that the Hebrews, the children of Israel, were multiplying. And Pharaoh started to understand that these folk are getting too powerful and they are outnumbering us. And so what we need to do uh, is we need to make life harder for them, right? We need to ramp up the kind of 
pressure and persecution on them. We need to make sure that their day-to-day experience is so overwhelmed with hardship and tragedy that the last thing in their mind is trying to come to Pharaoh's house because they barely can make the bricks that keep the food and the livelihood of their lives stable. Ain't that kind of what's happening around us? I mean, you know, it is not lost upon me, and I hope it's not lost upon you, that sometimes we can be made so busy that the busyness keeps us from being able to have the priorities that create life and life abundantly. And I want you to know, child of God, that there is a restoration project in America And although the ringleader called Donald Trump lost the election to make America great again, they still have a restoration project called Make America Great Again. And the the tragedy about it is while Trump may not be in office, uh, I, I, I tell folk here in the Bay Area, some of these elected officials, some of the worst conditions of the Bay Area is not because of Donald Trump. Amen. Donald Trump don't have no control over the Alameda County Board of Supervisors. Donald Trump don't have any control over the Berkeley mayor or over the police departments in San Francisco and Oakland and Richmond. Donald Trump uh, is not the one who can pull a lever and vote three people out of five votes and make sure we have money going to the schools versus the juvenile hall. Donald Trump is not the one who is determining uh, how much support we can get out here for all of our unhoused loved ones. No, uh, some of that responsibility lay with us. But it is incumbent upon you and I to know that they often will have us arguing and fighting and busy among ourselves. So their project will not be upended by the the purposes of justice and healing and restoration. And child of God, I want you to know that there's a moment and a time where our rest, our restoration as uh, followers of Jesus must coincide with our restoration as people who are living in our communities and this country and, dare I say, in the earth. The scripture says it like this, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so we don't divorce our faith from the call to make justice. We don't divorce our path to restoration and healing personally from the path to make restoration and healing in East Oakland. No, I want to be restored, but I also want my community to be restored. I want to be restored, but I also want my daughters to be restored. I want to be restored. I also want the schools to be restored. Why? Because I can't be restored as an individual while everything or else around me is falling down. I don't know. I don't know. Amen. Some of us think that, uh, you know, uh, we can we can uh, uh, close ourselves off. Amen. You know, I, I'm just going I'm just going to follow Jesus and I'm not going to worry about everything else that's happening. Amen. Uh, but I, I heard I think uh, it said that no person can rise above the worst condition of your people. Amen. You can think you are getting high, but how many know that thing will pull you down to the ground every time? Amen. So restoration must be a communal act, not just an individual endeavor. Give your neighbor a quick uh, fake high five and tell them we got to be restored together. And so this is why I like this particular passage, because Eutychus is a young man who is literally in the building the space where the proclamation of the gospel is happening. Eutychus is not someone who is far off. He's not someone who does not know about the work that is happening, but he literally is in the room. When you study the name of Eutychus, it actually means uh, one who is fortunate. And when you break down the passage, uh, the, the word for young that describes Eutychus is actually thought to be uh, a person between the age of 20 and 45. Hey Amen. That made me happy last night because that means I'm still young. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, Pastor, is hanging on. Hey Amen. I got about three more months. Hey Amen. Uh-huh. Before, before I, I, I'm not young no more, according to the Bible. Hey Amen. 
Uh huh. Uh huh. But 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 what's fascinating about this designation of Eutychus being someone thought falling between the age of 20 and 45 is that it kind of aligns in a familiar way to the kind of generational era we're living. That this is thought to be the age of X gen and millennials and that the emerging Y Z gen uh, is coming. Uh, oh, and it's coming fast. Amen. It's coming fast that if you were born uh, between the years, they say, of 1980 and 1995, then you are falling within this age group of millennials. And, 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 and I'm not going to you know, make this a message about millennials per se, but I do want you to appreciate that in this story, there is literally a representation of a whole generation of people who are literally having to push through hardship in order to be in the room where we know the gospel and the work of God is happening. I mean, in many respects, I want you to appreciate, child of God, that uh, we are dealing with generational challenges. We are dealing with generational challenges. And Eutychus represents a big chunk of the kind of generational dynamics that we as a church must uh, fully confront if we are going to be restored uh huh, as a people and as a community. I want you to think about all the many challenges that, that you and I must consistently wrestle with that are often known and not known to us. I want you to think about the ways in which uh, millennial populations uh, have different ways of processing the world as X-Gen folk and boomers. It is thought that folks like myself who fall squarely in the X-Gen are bridgers between the boomers and the millennials because we remember what a tape recorder, cassette tape was like. Mm -hmm. We remember what life was like when there was no internet. Mm -hmm. Amen. But if you talk to the millennials and the Gen Ys and Zs, they look about as dumbfounded as I did when my parents tried to explain the 8-track to me. Or a uh, 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 a world. I remember the first time we got our VCR. Amen. And I remember the theological conversations I had to overhear between my parents about a VCR. Oh, it was a theological conversation. Now, now we don't even think about it. Amen. We 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 don't talk about VCR. We we don't even talk about. We talk about Netflix. We talk about an on demand lifestyle. Think about this. In a time when we have now become addicted and, and determined by an on-demand lifestyle, we are still trying to figure out, God, why are you taking so long to fix a problem that I'm used to pulling my remote control out and changing the channel when I don't like what I see? I mean, you know, it's so fascinating how you literally can bend time to your own appetite. There was a time on Thursday nights where everybody in our communities at 8 p.m. was sitting down looking at one show. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody. Amen. That don't happen no more. You watch shows when you want to watch a show. Amen. And you surely don't want nobody online spoiling the show. Folk be talking about don't post online for two days. I'm like, man, you better come on. I'm an X-Gen. I got to see the thing soon as it come out. Somebody say amen. In a time when we are used to on-demand, immediate gratification, we are dealing with the reality that sometimes God's timeline will take so much longer than what you've been trained to accept. 
And what do you do, child of God, when God takes longer than what you are willing or able to accept? Uh, how, how long are we willing to wait before we start counting folk out? Before we count ourselves out? Before we move on to the next thing? Because this is taking too long. Well, in the biblical text, we find a few things that I think I want to highlight for you and I that are critical to what it means for us to ensure we don't count ourselves out and when or when we fall that we get back up again. The first thing that I want to say, verse number nine, the scripture says that Eutychus was sitting in a window. Amen. And they were literally there. Speaking until midnight, lamps were in the room upstairs where they were meeting. And he began to sink off into a deep sleep. While Paul talked longer, overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three-fourths below and was picked up dead. The first thing I want to tell you is don't go out like that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't go out like that. Please, come on, put that in the chat and just tell, tell the person, hey amen, on your virtual road, don't you go out like that. Don't, don't you dare go out like that. What am I talking about? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, suggest that, you know, we was gangsters growing up, amen, because there was only one gangster in our household, amen. <laughs> He's a Vietnam veteran, praise God. The rest of us, we was want to be something when he wasn't around. But when you in the street and somebody does something to intimidate you, your partners be like, man, don't you go out like that. What was they saying? Man, you, you, you're better than that, right? And so there are several ways that I see Eutychus challenging you and I not to go out like that. The scripture says that he's in a room and the lamps were burning. Back during that time, a lamp was not an electrical device, but lamps were ran by fire and lanterns that produced smoke. And so in many respects, Eutychus and the followers of Jesus listening to Paul. Remember, I said earlier, they were thought to have been worshiping in the dark in order to hide. Right. So these believers are boldly saying we're not going to be hiding. We are going to be boldly gathering. And Paul is there talking to them till the midnight hour. They got smoked out because lamps were burning. I will use my Holy Ghost imagination that perhaps one of the reasons why Eutychus fell out the window was because he was smoked out of the room. That the lamps burning created so much smoke that it literally choked the life out of Eutychus. And it makes me think about one of the many ways that we often can go out like that. That we get smoked out of our own place where God is. What are the things that can smoke us out? There are bad theologies that can smoke us out. There are terrible takes around our humanity that smoke us out. Church hurt can smoke us out. Uh, the sicknesses that are in our bodies can smoke us out. How many of you know of times in your life where you felt like I'm not going back to that place no more? Oh, them folk over there ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. Oh, them folk over there, they didn't call me. Them folk didn't come visit me. And, and, and those, those, those factors cause you to start getting choked up to a place where you feel like even though I know God is there, I won't go back to that place because I got choked out. Or the scripture says that uh, Eutychus was overcome by sleep. Meaning Eutychus was so fatigued and tired that he literally fell out of the window. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you were so burned out, you were so at your wit's end 
Life literally got sucked out of you because you were not able to live in balance or self-care. You weren't conscious of the surroundings because if you're tired, why are you sitting in a window? <laughs> I mean, how, how much fatigue and, 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 and sleepiness and bad judgment could you be overcome by that you're not mindful of your surroundings and you literally get burnt out of a place where you know healing resides. Or the last thing I think, you know, I'm telling you not to go out like that, is you find that Paul, God bless Paul, prolific writer, teacher, church planner. But in this text, Paul was talking too long. <laughs> Paul said, the scripture said Paul started talking when they met. Talk till midnight. And I, it, don't, it, it ain't lost on me that the end of the scripture says, he talked till dawn. Now, I don't know what Brother Paul was talking about, but sometimes you can go out like that by being talked out of a place where you know your healing and peace resides. When you are lectured too long and a conversation is only one-sided, you need a better teacher and you need a better conversation partner. Sometimes, child of God, we can't allow ourselves to go out like this. So in your own life, you got to ask yourself the question, am I being smoked out, burned out, or talked out of my healing and restoration process? Do I need some filters if you're getting smoked out? We had, you know, some folk come and check out our HVAC because we're trying to get our space in the utmost highest quality so whenever we are able to reconvene, we're not, you know, breathing each other's droplets. And they told me there's a certain filter that once the air goes through the filter, it'll take out all of the, 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 the COVID droplets in the time of, of these, these uh, fires. And all the metals that are in the air, it'll take out all their filters that you can put in your life that can take out all of the things that are trying to smoke you out. Some of us need to make sure that we are not being burned out. We're not being talked out of the place where God has us. Why? So we can remain proximal to our healing and our restoration. The second thing that the scripture says that I want us to be mindful of is that help is nearer than we think. Oh, it's so powerful to know that verse number 10, Paul went down and bent over the young man and took him in his arms. Isn't it interesting that Paul was, was there uh, near enough to provide help to a young man who did not know that help was even needed? that he was in need of a life-giving help out. And I want you to know, child of God, that help is always closer to you than you think. That some of us may not be fully aware that help is literally right around the corner. I mean, those, those commercials are funny where he talks about, uh, uh, help me, I'm falling down and I can't get up. But the whole purpose of the commercial was to promote the life alert, the button that you can place and put in a call to a 24-hour hotline because there was always somebody on the other side that when you press the button for life alerts, that somebody was going to pick up and make sure that help was sent to you wherever you were. Child of God, I want you to know uh, that you have a life alert. I want you to know that you have a button that you can push. You have the ability when you are in need of restoration 
and healing, you don't have to wonder where my help is going to come from. I mean, what would it mean for you to understand that my help is nearer than I think? That I have access to help. The help that is not just in the esoteric or in the supernatural, but I have help that is even within my grasp here. Amen. I mean, it's not lost on me that in a time of mental health awareness, we still have access to therapists and counselors. Somebody holler, help is nearer than I think. It's not lost upon me that in a time of a global pandemic, we have access to vaccines. Somebody holler, help is nearer than I think. It's not lost on me that when your child is struggling in school and they can't read or write, there are tutors and teachers and mentors that are able to help them get over the hump. Somebody holler, help is closer than I think. It's not lost on me that when your mother and your father forsake you, that God will lift you up. Somebody holler, help is closer than you think. And I want you to know today, child of God, that God has always put somebody in your life that can become the concrete expression of the help that God will always want extended to you. Well, I want you to know that all you got to do is learn to push a button called prayer. I want you to know you need to learn to push a button called worship. I want you to know you need to learn to push a button called praise. I want you to know you need to learn to push a button called reading your word. I want you to know you need to learn to push a button that serves as your life alert. And if you're like me, amen, the more times I've needed life, the more times I've needed help, God has never let me down. Uh, you know, uh, I've gotten to a place now uh, that when God don't come in the time allotment that I want, uh, I have enough faith and confidence uh, that I'm just going to keep waiting uh, on God. Lord, help me to wait on God. Come on, put in the chat. I got to wait on God. Uh, I know and I have been convinced that help is on the way. And I know that if I can wait on God, even if I keep pushing that button, you know, sometimes you be in the elevator and the elevator door don't close and you start pushing the I wish I had some elevator riders up in here. You know that pushing that button don't do nothing to speed up the doors closing. But you know in your mind that maybe I didn't push it hard enough the first time. And don't you dare be in an elevator huh, where the light don't work on the button you push. Uh, 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 and you in there, you just pushing the button. Uh, why won't uh, this door close? Uh, uh, not knowing that the first time you push that button, uh, uh, the doors were getting ready uh, to kick in. I remember a story about Daniel. Lord, I feel like preaching in here. Being in the lion's den. And he was praying and praying. And he was asking for, for uh, God to deliver him. And Daniel did not get the immediate deliverance he thought he should have got. Uh, but, but God spoke to Daniel and said, I heard you the first time. You prayed. Uh huh. Tell your neighbor, God heard you the first time. Uh huh. The first time you pushed that life alert, God heard you. The first time you offered up that intercessory prayer, God heard you. The first time you lifted up holy hands, God heard you. And God told Daniel, uh, Michael the archangel uh, was dispatched to come see about you. But the devil held him up. Oh, uh, Lord, I feel some of the old church cliches coming on me. Uh, somebody holler, delayed uh, does not mean denied. Uh, just because uh, your blessing may have been delayed. 
Lord, I feel it. Uh, don't mean that it's been denied. Uh, God heard you the first time. Uh, and because you pressed that life alert, uh, because you found yourself sprawled all on the ground, uh, looking up, talking about, I fall in uh, and I can't get up. Uh, stay down there uh, until your help comes. Uh, don't you dare uh, try to get up on your own accord. Uh, don't waste your life alert uh, uh, but let God pick you up uh, and give you a testimony uh, somebody holler help me uh, oh I need the help of the Lord uh, and that's why the last thing I'll say uh, is that when the help arrives uh, the help is able to remind you child of God uh, like Paul said don't be alarmed I still see life in you uh, uh, pat yourself on the chest and say there's life in me uh, pat yourself on the chest and say there's something living in me uh, oh and I need the Holy Spirit uh, to stir up the gift uh, that God has placed inside of me uh, I need the Holy Spirit uh, uh, to, 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 to lose some things inside of me uh, I need the Holy Ghost uh, to rain down on me uh, and make alive the things uh, that the devil thought were day. I love Paul having the eyes of the spirit to be able to see life in the boy when everybody else saw nothing but death. Don't make it a metaphor, child of God. The fact that Luke, the physician, is writing the book of Acts means that he knows what death looks like. He was not speaking metaphorically, but he was saying that this boy had died uh, and God was able uh, to look through the eyes of Paul uh, and say I know what the doctor says uh, but I see life in him I want you to know uh, that there will be people uh, who will try to rob the miracle out of your life. Uh, they'll try to reduce your relationship uh, to an intellectual thing, uh, to a thing where the supernatural can't happen. Uh, but I'm here to tell you uh, that the same God that performed miracles back in the day uh, is able to perform a miracle today. Uh, God can can do anything but fail. Do I have a witness today that believes that you better not count us out? I know we're on the ropes, but don't you dare count us out. I know they're trying to come for your voting rights, but don't you dare count us out. I know they're trying to come for your family, but don't you dare count us out. I know they gave you that diagnosis uh, but don't you dare count us out uh, because there's life in you uh, there's life in me uh, there's life in us uh, and as long as there's life in us uh, you can begin again uh, in the power of the Holy Ghost uh, oh I need you to know child of God uh, that life uh, will always win out uh, life will always supersede death uh, life will always beat your problem. Life will always beat your trial. Life will always resist the deathly forces that are seeking to steal your faith. So whatever you do, don't count yourself out. This week, walk into your office, your virtual office, and tell your boss, don't count me out. Have a spirit like Shikari Richardson, uh, who lost her race yesterday. Uh, some folk didn't like uh, that she didn't seem so humble. Uh, but I like that sister. Uh, I like that she still talked her talk. Uh, I know it's too new for some of us because uh, folk have robbed us of our confidence. Uh, but you ought to be like Shikari. Uh, you ought to walk up even when you lose. And you ought to tell the devil, don't you count me out. I will be back. Not because of my own power, but because of the power of God in us. Somebody shout hallelujah.
Don't count us out. A whole generation of young people. Some folk have written them off. An emerging generation. Some folk have written them off. Our elder generation. Some folk have written them off. But we need some of you up in here who know that God has not written anybody off. Uh, that you ought not count us out. I know COVID is ripping through our communities, but there's still life in there. Uh -huh. I know ignorance seems to be overwhelming the culture, but I still believe there's life in there. I know our children are overwhelmed with all kinds of forces, mental, spiritual, emotional, uh, but there's still life in our children. There's still life in our marriages, our families, our neighborhoods. Don't count us out. Whatever you do, child of God, don't count yourself out. Hallelujah. I want you to know when you find yourself falling out a window, when you find yourself in a free fall, oh, I want you to tell yourself on the way down, I'm not going out like this. I know I may have been smoked out this room, but I'm going to get me some filters to make sure that this smoke ain't going to stay in my system. I know I may have been burnt out of this room, but I'm going to have some new practices that are going to give me some more balance. I may have been lectured out of this room, but I'm going to find me a new conversation partner. Amen. So this thing can be a reciprocal conversation, but I will not go out the way I have right now because God is greater. Come on, God is greater. God, in the name of Jesus, I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you because we refuse to be counted out. We refuse to find ourselves caught in a cycle of death and, and, and obstruction. We refuse, oh God, to be counted out by the injustices in the world, by the afflictions in our body, by the attacks on our soul. By, Lord God, the dilemmas facing our youth, our children, our families. God, we don't deny these things to be real. They're as real as the smoke that choked Eutychus. They're as real as the sleep that overwhelmed him. They're as real, Lord God, as the talking, Lord God, that literally did not allow for a dialectical exchange. But God, I and we stand on your word today. Lord God, that there is always life and help within our grasp. God, help us to reach out for help when it is near. Help us to not limit help to what we imagine it must look like. But help us through our therapists. Help us through the doctors, the medical professionals that you've placed in our lives. Help us through our churches and our religious institutions, our moral centers. Help us, Lord God, through those who are called to govern. Lord God, help us, Lord God, so justice and healing can be made available to all who need it. And God, I pray that even after we hit the ground, God, may we always be surrounded by somebody who can tell us in such convincing manners that there's still life in them. There's still life in this situation. It does not have to define your future. But life will always win out. For we, the resurrected followers of the Most High God, we want to say thank you, Lord. 
You may be here today and you have not yet given your life to Jesus. I don't want you to miss out on an opportunity to do a metanoia, a U-turn, a repentant heart, a broken and a contrite spirit. God says God will not reject or turn away. So if you're here today and you need to give your life to the Lord, come on right there in the, your own home. You can say yes to God because God has already said yes to you. Or you may be someone who can acknowledge, you know, Pastor Mike, today I'm being smoked out, burned out, talked out of a place where I know my healing and restoration resides. If that's you, just confess to yourself aloud or make a testimony that I will not go out like that. I'm not going to allow the limitations of others' humanity or my own to cause me to fall out of the place where I know God is. I pray, God, that you will make help so available to us that it is undeniable and it is dear us. And we'll say thank you, God. We'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand praise. If you believe that there is still life in us today, God bless you, people of the way. We love you with the love of the Lord. Listen, we are excited about this season as we are continuing our live groups, our small groups. We want you, please, get plugged in. Uh, we had a great meeting with our leaders of live groups yesterday. And our men's group, our women's group, our justice ministry, uh, LGBTQ uh, live group is getting started back up. Uh, they're going to happen every other week, I believe. Uh, we have prayer groups that happen every Tuesday. Amen. I believe there's a morning group. Amen. That, that's being led. Morning prayer group. All you early risers that want to get full of the Holy Ghost before you go into your, your, your rest of your day. Get on there. Amen. There's some folk out. I hear there's almost 20 or so folk on there in the mornings praying together. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. And, 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 and we also want you to know that every Wednesday we are meeting virtually online, a private Zoom link uh, that we've made available to you, the members of the way. Please join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to grow with Pastor Mike uh, throughout the rest of this month and into next month. And uh, I think this past week we had over 30 folks joining. Amen. Wouldn't it be great to, to, amen, just have us all hanging out, asking questions and reading through the scriptures together and growing together, recapturing our faith in our community so we can withstand this season. I want you to know, people of the way, that this is still the time where our faith must be grounded in community. So don't be isolated. Don't fall into a place of loneliness, but let's connect in. Let's gather. Let's, let's, let's share the love and the faith and the power of God in the name of the Lord. God bless you. This is Pastor Mike. We're going to let you go. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you in the future. God bless you. God bless you in Jesus' name.